This interview is part of the SSEA Circumnavigator Summit, sharing experiences of members who circumnavigated. All engaged in this project are volunteers providing information solely for entertainment and education purposes. SSCA may edit and publish the interviews in the SSCA Circumnavigation Summit in audio and video formats to benefit its membership and as a recruiting tool. SSCA and participants assume no responsibility for the accuracy or validity of information shared in these interviews. Opinions stated do not necessarily reflect those of the Seven Sea Cruising Association. Hello everybody and welcome to the SSCA Circumnavigators Summit. My name is Jackie Lee from Trimoran Sloopmoosh and I have the privilege to interview some of these special members who have completed a circumnavigation. Many volunteers at SSCA are working hard to make the organization new and fresh and relevant to our members. So we hope you will enjoy this new series. Many sailors wonder what it takes to make a circumnavigation and whether they could do it. We will be interviewing SSCA members who did it. Believe it or not, over 100 members sailed around the world just in between the period between 2001 and 2019. And bravo to them. You will have a chance to hear many varied types of sailors. Solo sailors, families, two to three year voyages, 20 plus years, international members, former SSCA board members, motor vessel owners, celebrities, and regular sailors just like us. So, without further ado, let's get right to the interview. All right, welcome everyone, and we're so happy to have speaking with us tonight Jeff and Ann Posner on Sailing Vessel Joyful. Jeff and Ann were participants in a Cornell sailing event, as well as being SSCA members. Um, the sailing event was an around the world rally called the Blue Planet Odyssey. And we hope to get some views of how they felt in this odyssey and uh, their experiences as they went around the world. So welcome to you Jeff and Ann. It's great to speak with you tonight. Well thank you very much. We're happy to be here. Yeah, thank you Jackie. Thank you Jackie and Luke very much for this uh, project that you're doing. Alright, thank you. Can you tell us briefly each of your backgrounds and how you got into sailing? Well I was a uh, I did engineering acquisition and flight test in the U.S. Air Force, and Ann was a tennis pro, an artist, and also taught art wherever we lived. When I was assigned to work in the Netherlands, we learned dinghy sailing through the local sailing club, and we learned offshore sailing through the adventurous training wing of the British Army at Kiel, Germany, on the Baltic Sea. We further enriched our sailing experiences on boats in the Baltic, Mediterranean, and Caribbean seas. And also sailed the North Sea and made a transatlantic voyage. And we participated in yacht regattas before we bought our own boat. Uh, as also, Anne earned her skipper certification from the British Army. And when she did, they asked her back to teach. So she honed her skipper expertise by actually teaching British Army personnel to sail ocean-going boats on the Baltic Sea. She also sought, taught sailing to the blind when we later lived near Boston, Massachusetts. Wow! <laughs> That's amazing, Anne. Uh, both of you. That uh, sounds like a very high-powered way to learn about sailing and navigation, and you just really jumped right into it and uh, got going. And congratulations to Anne um, for becoming a, a, an instructor. So, wonderful. That's great. And uh, after you first started sailing, did you plan on a circumnavigation? 
No, Jackie. We were planning to sail primarily in the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, and Baltic seas, and possibly extending out to other areas of the world, which also necessitated ocean passages. Therefore, we wanted to buy a strong ocean-going boat. We could sail anywhere in the world. Wherever we sailed, we wanted to do scientific, educational, community, and Christian missionary work. So in 2013, we met SSCA members Greg and Joan Conover, who told us about the Blue Planet Odyssey Around the World Sailing Rally, which would start about 18 months later. Two aspects of the rally made us both immediately decide to join the rally to circumnavigate. Uh, One was because it was conducted by Jimmy Cornell and included scientific, educational, and community work as an integral part of the rally. We were so excited to hear that. And uh, I had gained a great deal of respect for Jimmy uh, from when I sailed across the Atlantic as a participant in his uh, ARC, Atlantic Rally for Cruisers, in 1994. And the Blue Planet Odyssey scientific, educational, community programs were excellent. Um, so although the rally did not include any missionary work, that wasn't a problem. Jimmy was fine with that. He's, we just did our missionary work independently during our circumnavigation. So we were all, we were able to achieve all of our personal sailing goals, um, at this time. It was fantastic. Your goals in sailing and doing things for people and service around the around the world just coordinated and fell in step with uh, an odyssey that came uh, right up to you. All right. So, what did what year did you start and from where? Well, we started our circumnavigation as a participant in the uh, Blue Planet Odyssey Rally from Key West, Florida, and we left on. 15 March 2015, and we started the circumnavigation when we were 68 and finished it at age 71. Wow, okay. And Anne? And yeah, I did, <laughs> I did the same thing. I was <laughs> we were both on the same boat. Um, I was started when I was 68 and finished when I was 71, so we were just... Um, so thankful that our health was still good and still is good so we were able to achieve this uh, activity yes I must say I must say that uh, by your voices you sound much younger than what you say your ages are you have this kind of liveliness and uh, life in your voice so uh, hopefully that's what uh, cruising and circumnavigating can do for us Can you briefly describe the general route you took? Yes. We sailed the trade wind route. From Key West, we sailed to Panama and through the Panama Canal. Then from the Panama Canal, we sailed southbound across the equator, then primarily westbound across the Pacific Ocean, uh, directly to Nukuhiva in the French Marquesas, then to Bora Bora, Tonga, then Vanuatu, and then to Mackay, Australia. In Australia, we sailed from Mackay down to the Sydney area, and then up the east coast through the Great Barrier Reef, over the north coast to Darwin, and then to Christmas Island in the South Indian Ocean. From Christmas Island, we sailed across uh, through Indonesia, back across the equator, through the Singapore Strait and Malacca Strait to Malaysia, and then on to Thailand. Then from Thailand, we sailed across the Indian Ocean to Sri Lanka, the Maldives, back across the equator to the Seychelles, Madagascar, Mozambique, and to Richards Bay, South Africa. Then from Richards Bay, South Africa, we sailed around the Cape of Good Hope, across the Atlantic Ocean to St. Helena, Brazil, across the equator again, to Barbados, 
and then finally closing the loop of the world to Key West. Nice uh, description of uh, your route and uh, the different countries that you visited. So, earlier you had mentioned um, something about choosing the right boat. And what kind of boat is joyful, and why did you get that particular kind of boat? Well, Sailing Vessel Joyful is a 2005 Bokier 40 Pilot Saloon. She's a French-built, blue-water cruising, solar solent-rigged fiberglass sloop with an aft cockpit. She weighs 10 tons, has a length of 41 feet 8 inches, a beam of 13 feet 3 inches, and a draft of 5 and a half feet. Although we bought her before we decided to circumnavigate, we first and foremost wanted a strong, safe, fast, modern blue water cruiser built for crossing oceans, just in case we decided to do transocean sailing. The boat turned out to be, or the boat had to be, easily sailed by one person, yet large enough for five people to comfortably live aboard. We also wanted a boat that we would enjoy sailing and maintain easily. We researched the market and visited a lot of sailboat factories in Europe. From our research, experience sailing on other people's boats, and listening to other sailors talk about the good and bad and ugly aspects of their boat, we decided that the Vauquier 40 Pilot Saloon was the kind of boat we wanted. Then we looked at the configuration, condition, and prices of new and used Vauquier 40 Pilot Saloons. So in addition to price, we looked at the advantages and disadvantages of buying new versus used. There's a lot of expensive equipment needed for long-distance cruising, and a used boat may have had a lot or all of the additional equipment already installed, but the equipment may be antiquated. A new boat may be far more reliable and require a lot less maintenance than a used boat. Additionally, a new boat may not experience failures, which can create difficulties on the open seas or at a remote location. In addition, the ability of the boat to meet physical requirements of circumnavigation, we also considered the pleasure of sailing and living aboard the boat. The Vauquier 40 Pilot Saloon was a very comfortable and it was easy for one person to sail. Her performance and comfort on the sea was impressive, and since the controls for all of the sails led back to the cockpit, it was not necessary to go forward to change the sail configuration. The layout was very comfortable for up to five people. She had two double cabins, a pilot berth, two ensuite heads, a saloon, galley, nav desk, and a large comfortable aft cockpit. Also, she provided an exceptional 270 degree view of the seas or land while seated at the saloon table because of the wraparound windows. Also, when we found Joyful, it was a brand new boat configured with about 90% of the options that we wanted. We decided that she was the boat for us. Although fitting her out for the circumnavigation was expensive, we also had mostly state-of-the-art systems and relatively little maintenance and repair. Wow, that was a, a very thorough uh, answer, and I'm sure people benefited from the different reasons that you... Uh, the reasoning that you did in choosing the boat that you did, and it's true weighing the the pros and cons of new versus used. <clears throat> Sometimes when you uh, can find a boat that was maybe formerly owned by SSCA members, <laughs> you might be getting a pretty good boat that was really set up for somebody who's uh, who's been there and done it and uh, knew what kinds of things they wanted. So, thanks for that very thorough and, and uh, accurate answer, Jeff. Going on, you did mention about SSCA. Um, when did you first hear about SSCA and why did you decide to join? When we lived where, uh, near Annapolis over 10 years before we started our circumnavigation, uh, the SSCA held a GAM in connection with the Annapolis Boat Show. We attended that GAM and had a fantastic time and immediately appreciated what the SSCA offers to boaters. Uh, so we just love the SSCA and we're, we're very
very happy to um, get to know about it. You got to go to some GAMS. That's uh, a very fun, fun events that they, they have, and I'm sure the atmosphere in the SSCA <coughs> GAMS uh, is a lot of fun. And you talk to people, and everyone is uh, everyone is enthusiastic, and everyone's willing to help and give advice and share ideas. And I'm sure for someone who was just learning about the organization, it is it is a fun thing. It was the kind of thing that attracted us: is that uh, people are so willing to share um, the things that they knew and to help out people, especially when we were starting, uh, help out people that were novices. Do you have any kind of uh, a story about an SSCA -er or some kind of benefit that you got from an SSCA uh, cruising station or some story like that about SSCA? We have something fantastic to say about the SSCA and how helpful they were uh, during our circumnavigation. Uh, we had four circumstances that really stood out. Three involved Mrs. Joan Conover from the SSCA. She's a, a great member, she and her husband, Greg Conover. And uh, Joan is an amazing woman and always very helpful to help a lot of people in difficult situations. And whereas our problems on Joyful were very minor, we are in awe of what she does. And... Um, Joan and Greg are the ones that introduced us to the Blue Planet Odyssey. And uh, Joan helped us in the U.S. and Australia with sat phone and single sideband issues and led us to two additional types of scientific data we could collect, which were needed by organizations and universities studying radiation and sargasso seaweed. And uh, she helped us uh, obtain, she gave us a Geiger counter battery-operated Geiger counter we could keep on Trifle to uh, gather the uh, data uh, tracing radioactivity throughout the world. We really appreciate that. And um, another story relating to the SSCA was when I taught about SSCA's clean wake approach to the ocean regarding plastic pollution. I was asked to teach a class in Sydney, Australia uh, regarding plastic pollution and its detrimental effects to the ocean and uh, life on land and sea. Okay, wow, that's good, yes. Uh, Joan has been uh, very helpful to promoting SSCA for sure. And um, it was great that she did give you those, those uh, tips. And yes, I remember, was shortly after the Fukushima incident that she was very strongly worried about radiation um, in, the, in the ocean, speci specifically closer to Japan, and then how it would disseminate. And we did participate in that also. So that was uh, something that all of us could help do in helping to research about uh, radiation in the oceans. All of us spread around the different oceans. We could uh, get information that sometimes was not available to other scientists. Okay, thank you very much for the SSCA story. And now going to on to a different subject, one that always is in the people's mind, is uh, weather. How did you manage to get weather bulletins and to sail in good weather conditions to avoid bad weather? And uh, was it possible to avoid all bad weather? Or what's the worst weather story that you lived through? What kind of advice can you give us? Well, generally, we had good weather for virtually the whole circumnavigation and no weather that was really terrible. And the reasons were primarily the following. The route and the times of year that we sailed gave us the best overall chance for good weather. We closely monitored weather forecasts and listened closely to local knowledge. Before we left the port, we used a number of weather forecasts that were available on the Internet to determine when we believed that the weather conditions were acceptable for the coming passage or as much of the passage for which we could have the forecasts. 
at sea, we used primarily sail mail grips, and we used our radar when there was squalls around. We also used weather routers for regions of the world in which we could not get sail mail reception, primarily from the Seychelles down to South Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope, and up the South Atlantic to St. Helena. Also, we were very conservative in our approach as to what weather conditions we were willing to sail in. Sometimes we would wait for a week or longer until weather conditions were acceptable to us. For example, after waiting four months in Richards Bay, South Africa, for the season to be right for sailing around the Cape of Good Hope, we waited day by day for another month for the weather conditions to be acceptable for us to sail to Durban, South Africa, and then after sailing to Durban, we made it for several more days for the right weather to sail the two-day passage on the most dangerous waters of the world called the Wild Coast. There were times when other sailors would set sail in conditions that we chose not to. We would see them at the next port with their boat on the hard, getting something repaired that had been damaged due to the weather. And as sat phones continued to advance and prices continued to drop, now we would probably use the sat phones as our primary source for offshore weather. However, we would definitely keep our single sideband as a backup. And as for the worst weather conditions we experienced at sea, as we encountered 18-foot waves with 40-knot winds, and also in a marina in Richards Bay, we experienced a 72-knot wind while at the berth. Well, wow, sounds like South Africa can, can be quite uh, adventurous and lively, as they say. Um, did you find that the weather routers services that you used were useful to you? Uh, yes, uh, they were, and they uh, were very helpful, and they were very interactive. We were able to communicate by text on the ocean, and we avoided some really severe weather by listening to them, some things that had come up that had not previously been forecast. I remember the um, other people from the Blue Planet Odyssey fleet they had actually a phenomenal kind of voyage uh, using the weather router who did route them around some weather that was coming or utilized, I can't remember exactly, or utilized what weather there was on the side in order to improve their route and get there. And they were quite pleased because I remember at first they were all kind of saying, oh, I don't know, maybe we should wait. I think we're early in the season. And then <coughs> having the weather router really helped to uh, reassure them. So that's great. And where else did you use a weather router besides South Africa? Well, just for the, basically the South Indian Ocean because right through that the South Indian and South Atlantic Oceans, there was basically no sail mail reception in that part of the world. And I will say one other thing was that going around the Wild Coast and the Cape of Good Hope, there was a local sailor by the name of Des who just did personal weather routing. But he had been around the Cape of Good Hope like 20-some-odd times, and he knew the weather, he knew South Africa, and he was absolutely invaluable for that stretch of sea uh, where you can get 90-foot waves. Wow. And uh, can is is he like uh, available to any sailors who are wanting to have that kind of service? Uh, how did you get a hold of him, or how did you find out about him? We found out about him. Actually, I believe it was from Anne and Jonathan Lloyd uh, while we were in Richards Bay, and we met him. And he said that yes, he's happy. Any sailor that can contact him. Uh, but I, he was, I don't know how long he will continue to do that. He was uh, about our age, but he was absolutely invaluable. He had been doing that for a, a number of years when we got there. All right, wonderful. It's pe people like that that we have so much admiration for, and those people like Herb, Herb and uh, people like Bob McDavid and all those people that just do those services for people and uh, most of the time they're not getting any commercial gain or anything other than the 
satisfaction of helping people. Um, so great, that's good information and good to know. So thank you for your communications. Um, you were saying you had uh, satellite phones and you had uh, the SSB radio. Um, what did you find, well, like you said, what did you find were the pluses and what were the minuses? Well, the, the, we had the, uh, as Ann and Jonathan Lloyd recommended on theirs, the uh, Iridium Go, but at the time that we were doing our circumnavigation, it was very expensive. I presume it's much less expensive now. So we, what we did was we would primarily, we would buy a local SIM card wherever we were in whatever country we were, and we would use that for communications in the country with the phone, and uh, we'd use that for Internet and for email, which was our primary contact to keep in touch with family and friends. But uh, on the sea, because of the sail mail limitations of 90 minutes per week, and sometimes it could take uh, 20 minutes just to download one set of grips, we kept our communication other than the weather to an absolute minimum, and we kept the satellite phone uh, purely for emergency backup. That's uh, good advice. Uh, I think also Anne mentioned that getting the local SIM cards and whenever you have uh, internet connections near land uh, nowadays, pretty much around the world you can get internet and with uh, some of those apps, with some of the apps like What's Up, you don't have to worry about telling your family, oh, the number in this country now is this or that, because you can always keep the same number, so that makes it a lot more convenient. And also mentioned that getting communications there in the Indian Ocean was quite difficult. And I think now, uh, probably, as you say, with sat phone being more reasonable, uh, lots of people, they just use it to quickly get the weather info, and that goes quite quick for the communications. A different subject again. People are always uh, concerned about security on boats, and we are always curious People are curious on whether or not you had any kind of issues with piracy, thievery, or security issues. Um, how did you deal with those uh, kind of things? Our basic approach was to stay away from dangerous places. We used local knowledge, government travel advisories, noon site, and several other websites to find out where there was piracy on the seas or high crime rates at the landfalls. We did our best to avoid these locations. The closest we got to known pirate zones was when we sailed on the Singapore and Malacca Straits, and also when we just passed the Sunda Strait going north, uh, the area around Jakarta was very bad. Uh, also, when we sailed from Thailand to Sri Lanka, we stayed clear of the Nicobar Islands because of the piracy. And so... And, of course, obviously, the Horn of South Africa. So we basically just stayed away from those areas. We also secured the boat when we were at anchor in, or in a marina in high theft areas like Madagascar, Mozambique, and South Africa. We chained our crucial on-deck equipment onto the boat, such as uh, Joyful's dinghy, the dinghy engine, on-deck jerry cans of diesel and water, etc. And uh, as... The one issue that people do raise is firearms, and after a lot of consideration and discussion with other circumnavigators and weapons experts, we chose not to bring firearms with us on board. For weapons, we carry two flare guns, emergency flares, and scuba knives. The, it's true that uh, the issue of carrying weapons or not is a very controversial one, and uh, I think uh, something that uh, people have to think about and consider wisely before they make any kind of decision about that and that has to just be a personal thing uh, with what they feel comfortable with. 
The other thing I think is uh, very common sense, like you said, was to chain things on board and do stuff like that, but sometimes people, I don't know, maybe they, be, because mostly the areas are uh, very, seem like very safe and that sort of thing, that people get a little bit lazy, but I think that's a, a good advice is to make sure that anything you don't really want to lose that you should be sure that it's secure on board. How did you sustain yourself financially for this uh, circumnavigation? We planned our finances before starting. We saved up enough money to support ourselves while on the circumnavigation. We put all of our routine bills on automatic payment and paid all of our U.S. bills online. And we had our mail sent to a relative who told us about anything that was out of the ordinary should communicate by email. And we also used ATMs for local currency throughout the world. Uh, the cities and even the tiny remote countries, except St. Helena, had ATMs. Uh, because we did not trust the mail systems in many of the countries, we flew back to the U.S. once a year to pay our taxes and while we routine medical checks. Now, because we sold our house and got rid of a lot of things and put the rest in storage before we started our circumnavigation, our routine costs on the voyage were actually lower than our costs on land. We still had a reserve, however, available for contingencies. And regarding other boating couples, we know one couple that supports themselves by building websites while living on their boat. But we only mm -hmm. saw them in Australia where they always had sufficient internet to be able to keep their business healthy. That was good. You were able to plan your finances ahead of time and uh, arrange with having family and other people to help you out and then visiting the states every now and then. Okay. Yeah, I think also that uh, the internet option <coughs> is becoming more and more available to cruisers. What they do is stop for a while, I guess, in an area where it's reasonable costs for internet and good speed and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, that's making it more available for cruisers people to take off and even if they don't have a pension to uh, make some money along the way. Now Jeff and Ann, with hindsight, is there anything that you would have done differently? Actually overall we were very happy with the decisions we made. We had no severe weather, we had no major breakages or failures of our boat, and no major health problems. The one thing that would have been nice to have had would have been more solar and battery power. We had sufficient. We had enough electrical power that we never plugged into shore power from the time we left Key West all the way around the world and back to Key West. However, we, we had repeated days of no sun for the solar cells and no wind for the wind generator. We would have to run the engine to charge the batteries. Okay, so in that case, would you have also recommended either a portable gas generator or some sort of... Uh generator um, to help you out in those conditions? No, we really were very happy with what we had and the generator would have taken additional space. That additional space could was used what we, where we would have put a generator. We had spares and food on board, so we felt on the trade-off that we were better off the way we were. Okay. That's good to know also. What were some of the biggest highlights of your voyage? Well, that is a very difficult question, Jackie, because <laughs> there were so many wonderful there were so many wonderful aspects of the voyage. It's so difficult to just narrow them down, but I'll try. Uh, we loved the time at sea with ever-changing seas and skies and we love the ocean crossings. I, I just love crossing oceans. 
on a sailboat uh, because of the extra challenge, the beauty of nature, and the happiness associated with choosing the right boat for such an endeavor. Uh, that, that was always such a thrill, every moment of uh, ocean crossings, even if the weather was uh, challenging. I just love that so much. And another thing that we really loved about circumnavigating was what you hear from absolutely everybody, and that is the exceptional, friendly, kind, and helpful people at every landfall. And, uh, oh, we just looked forward to getting to the next landfall to meet people and then when we had to sail away, we felt so sad to leave those good people. But we we always had faith that there's something good that's going to happen at the next landfall. Another aspect of the, the voyage that we loved was uh, the actual land, the, the countries, the, the physical land, the animals, and the plants everywhere were spectacular. Uh, another tent wonderful aspect of the voyage that enhanced the experience all the way around the world was the scientific, educational, and community service program that we did as part of the Blue Planet Odyssey and continued after we left the rally in Australia. For example, as a part of the educational work, we partnered with the Round Hill Elementary School in Virginia. And throughout the voyage, we would hold Skype sessions between the students in Virginia and the students at the various landfalls uh, throughout the world and send those photos, videos, and artifacts that we collected from each country back to that school in Virginia. And the, the principal of the school used the Skype sessions that we orchestrated and the information we sent to encourage the students. The result was a dramatic increase in the motivation to learn and the test scores of the students. But um, even though all of those uh, were wonderful aspects of our voyage, the be we believe that the best aspect of the voyage by far <coughs> excuse me, was our missionary work. Uh, that was our primary reason for the circumnavigation. We gave art and music ministry events throughout the world to people at churches, orphanages, schools for special needs students, aged care facilities, homeless shelters, etc., inner city people. All these people proved that the same challenges and needs of mankind prevail throughout the world. And they greatly appreciated our endeavors to enrich their lives. That's an absolutely fabulous answer, and uh, that you were so involved to give back, to give service, to pay forward, um, to motivate. It's wonderful the story about the children in the school and how they would be able to communicate with children in schools in different countries, and then to receive uh, different things from those schools where they had spoken to the different children, and maybe in some places they didn't even speak the same language. Uh, that is absolutely wonderful and so in keeping with, with the SSCA principles of camaraderie and especially leaving a clean wake all over the country and all over the world and um, because it's true that so much of the world when we go to these places the people are so giving and so wonderful and I think um, I thank you personally for all that you did to uh, both of you did to give back to the world well it was our pleasure and we really believe that that's one of the things with cruising that makes it wonderful is the opportunity to help others in other parts of the world uh, and, and back at home is one of the best things that we find about cruising. It really ups the motivation on every place you go, the interest level, and we can see the results in the people we worked with. All right. 
And after your circumnavigation, did you continue cruising? I'm sure you continued all your missionary work and your projects, but uh, did you continue cruising and what came next? Well, when we were in South Africa, we found out that a family member would have to move from her home to Texas because of her health. We decided that after completing the circumnavigation, we would sell the boat and move near her. So after we arrived in Key West, we Annapolis, sold the boat, and moved to Texas. However, as the move has proved beneficial to her health, she is much better now than she had been, we went ahead and bought a canal boat in France, and we will sail the canal boat for about three months a year and continue to do the scientific education community and missionary work on the rivers and canals of eight European countries. We will also write books about our circumnavigation and regarding our efforts involving our missionary canal boat endeavors in Europe. Oh, wow, great. That's wonderful. And what a, what a wonderful story. That, and I'm very happy that your family member has, has improved in her health and recovered enough that you would be able to do this project on the canal boats and uh, continue your missionary uh, work. Uh, I think that's wonderful that you keep going and we can hear, as I said before, we can hear the energy and the vibrancy in both of your voices that all of this really keeps you going and keeps you young. So that's wonderful, wonderful. It's so great to hear that. I'm glad that you'll be able to explore the canals. Is there any other subject, other than what we've spoken about in the questions previously, that you would like to share with us um, about the circumnavigation or uh, anything related in that area? Absolutely, uh, Jackie. would love to do that. Uh, one of the reasons our circumnavigation was such an enjoyable experience was that we kept safety first, fun second, and we also prayed. Those things added up to our success. We listened to other circumnavigators and sailors who have crossed oceans and incorporated some of what they said into our planning and preparation for our voyage. We prepared for, we prepared for a full spectrum of contingencies with safety equipment and spare parts. For example, Although we fitted out our boat with state-of-the-art navigation equipment, we also used British Admiralty and other paper charts and pilot books. We did all of our basic navigation on paper charts throughout the world and fed the waypoint information into our electronic chart plotter. We also had a spare chart plotter we could easily install, even at sea if our primary chart plot plotter failed. We were also prepared to switch over to astro navigation if our electronic navigation systems failed due to a lightning strike or some other reason. And we had two sextants on board with accompany, accompanying books of tables. Uh, I'd like to also point out um, that we used a hydrovane wind vane for our steering for over 90% of the circumnavigation. That was one of the most important pieces of equipment that we added to Joyful. We um, were so thankful every day that we used that um, system for steering. Sailors often asked us, how did we handle provisioning and water management? That is so important because it uh, involves life all life on board. For my provisioning plan, I took into consideration the nutritional requirements to keep an adult not just alive, but healthy and happy during a circumnavigation. Morale on board an ocean-going yacht is extremely important, and food is a huge component to make that happen. I took my cal calculations to both the U.S. Navy and U.S. Army nutritionists for their comments and recommendations. I was happy they both approved of my plan and said it was excellent. Uh, that gave me tremendous confidence throughout the circumnavigation that all aboard 
would have a good chance to be healthy, happy, and thereby safe. Uh, I then considered how many people might be on board and what could be our longest passage. This would help me decide how much food to keep on joyful at any given time. Uh, for an example, our longest nonstop ocean passage was between Panama and Nukuhiva, French Polynesia. That passage took 40 days. However, I knew if we were dismasted early on in that Pacific crossing southwest of the Galapagos, we might be adrift for a very, very long time before we reached land or were rescued. Therefore, throughout the circumnavigation, I provisioned for four months of food on board just to try to be extra safe. Also, this is something that I think might be considered by other people wanting to circumnavigate. Uh, one never knew for sure what the next landfall would have uh, for food um, so we could reprovision our boat once we got there. Uh, as an example, strikes, economic disasters, political strife, etc. could make it impossible to acquire food. Like in French Polynesia, when we got there, it was impossible to buy butane or propane due to a national strike in France. Mm. But that didn't affect Joyful because I never relied on having to cook at sea during our circumnavigation. And um, also, people always want to know what exactly did I stock for food on Joyful? Uh, my provisioning plan included four types of food. Uh, this was very important because ocean crossings can put challenges on uh, the different types of foods. Fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, we consumed first because obviously they would go bad very quickly. Um, we also then would eat pre-cooked frozen steaks, fish, chicken, etc. Uh, we would eat those, those frozen things because you never knew when the electricity, the freezer or refrigerator could go out and not be able to be repaired at sea. Um, I also stocked the boat with canned animal protein, you know, like tuna fish and chicken, beef, etc., like that. Um, also canned vegetables and fruit. I also had another type of food uh, as dried breads, fruits, and dried meat, like jerky. We had nuts, and we also stowed dried, non-fat milk. We then had another type of food um, in case we had consumed all of those. And uh, that was uh, large packages of freeze-dried foods. And as a last resort, if all those provisions were consumed... We could always resort to eating the box of emergency rations we purchased from the Viking Life Raft Company, which would keep four adults alive for one month. I dedicated easy-to-eat snacks to be consumed during night watches to help people uh, on watch stay awake during calm nights on long passages and ocean crossings. Those were very, very important to us. Um, most importantly, I also kept a supply of fun party foods like Mexican food so we could have fiestas at sea for events like crossing the equator and the international date line for birthdays, halfway points of a passage, etc. And I also kept delicious candy from various countries to give as prizes during the daily game time we had after dinner before night watches began. Everybody got prizes, whether they won the games or not. This was excellent for morale at sea. People loved this so much uh, that we continued game night with prizes, even at anchors, uh, at anchorages or in a marina. Now, water management is something, obviously, that is uh, paramount to get right. 
We purchased two excellent reverse osmosis water makers designed to make potable drinking water from ocean water. One was 12 volts powered only with, uh, well, it was 12 volts, but it also had the capability to be operated by hand. And the other um, water maker was also uh, excellent as well, good, super good quality. And that was a manual operated one, which we stowed in the ditch bag, along with a NATO certified solar still. In case Joyful's two 58-gallon water tanks were compromised, we also kept a large supply of drinking water lashed in the aft stateroom and aft shower, as well as two jerry cans lashed on deck. We used the British Army's method of rationing water while on long ocean crossing uh, passages, uh, which was to regulate and quantify all water consumption and other means to help ensure there was enough drinking water available at all times to sustain life. Um, our philosophy was when we used one-eighth of Joyful's water on board, we began making reverse off osmosis water from ocean water. It rarely rained at sea throughout our circumnavigation. So if we had depended on rainwater to replenish our tanks, we would have been out of luck. Wow, okay, great. What a phenomenal amount of planning that you did there. And, uh, and wonderful... Uh, uh, ways of thinking about how things are going to happen and contingency plans and what could happen and I love the idea of the the candies and the prizes um, I'm sure that was a wonderful thing to keep up morale so great uh, that's uh, wonderful information that people can use for sure and those that think that they are going to be able to catch rain I see that from your experience um, they might be uh, <coughs> just um, sipping little bits of seawater if not uh, and watching the rainstorms all around the boat and not getting any at all so that's a good uh, advice having the water maker on board and you can always offer people up what we call fresh squeezed seawater. <laughs> <laughs> now, are there any other parting words of wisdom that you have uh, leaving us on this interview and wrapping up? Well, one thing was our philosophy uh, just in life is that if you have a dream, then make it happen. Whatever you have to do, think about that, plan for it, work for it, but make sure that you make it happen. And I would like to um, convey uh, something that I consider very important, so does Jeff, and that is to consider what you can do for others as you cir circumnavigate or even sail in home waters. Uh, people from every country we visited were so kind to us, did their best to accommodate us and made us feel welcomed. We purposefully endeavored to give back to these people by using our God-given gifts to serve them. We bought school supplies from local shops in each country, made them into individual kits, and gave them to students, orphans, elder care residents, and others. We taught art lessons and gave musical performances to people of all ages at homeless shelters, nursing homes, and orphanages. We picked up plastic pollution, visited special needs schools, and gave two months' worth of food to a starving family of 16 people. If motivated, we believe every sailor can devote a tiny part of their time on land to do good for others, and it doesn't have to be pre-planned or involve expenditure of money. We never pre-planned what we would do for others before we got to a country. It just was obvious within a couple of hours of being there, we knew, oh wow, look, there's a elderly, uh, an orphanage for elderly people in 
Sri Lanka or, you know, countless things on every landfall. There were many, many opportunities to spend a little time uh, extemporaneously helping others. And um, we highly recommend to all who sail within the USA, foreign waters, or even while circumnavigating the world, uh, that they consider serving others along the way. It's really fun, and it it enriches everyone's lives. Wow! And we also wanted to give yeah, we I'll also wanted to ahead. give our thanks to to you and to Luke for putting on this program for the SSCA. Uh, this is one way of giving back. It's taking a lot of your time and effort, but it's really worthwhile to have these videos, to have the local knowledge uh, from people who have been around the world so that as you are shaping your opinion on how to do it, that you have the additional information that you can glean from some of these other people on what worked for them. So we thank you because we know it's a lot of work to put this together. All right. Thank you very much for those very kind words. And I am just so inspired by your reflections on giving and that uh, I think it's super important, especially in these times where people seem to become more and more self-focused, self-centered, uh, that actually... Uh, those people that become self-centered like that find that they have less and less satisfaction in their life and all you, they would need to do is turn it around start giving some of the things that they have uh, and sharing with other people and suddenly they will see in their life the things that they have to be grateful for and how it uh, can just spread throughout the world. And I love the idea of your sharing like that. And we thank you so much for the things that you have done along your path in life. And for us, it's been super rewarding doing these uh, interviews. And we've gotten as much out of them as... Uh, the work that we've put into it, and it is uh, a joy to do it. So we thank you so much again, Jeff and Ann, for your participation in the Circumnavigator Summit, and we know that this will be a great interview for people to listen to, and thank you so much again for sharing. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Luke and Jackie. We, uh, and... Uh, all of SSCA for for being there for us and other sailors. If you enjoy this interview, make sure to listen to our other guests in the series. Subscribe to SSCA YouTube channel. Access the MP3 audio recording on SSCA website. Get the scoop on the latest SSCA activities and benefits. Read the latest Cruiser Bulletin, participate in the forum and Facebook group, and please promote our organization to who you think might benefit. <music>